Yeah. So like, to me, this is like getting the chance to just talk to some legends and you're one of them. So, <laughs> you know, you know, I don't know if you know this, but when you gave me this book, yeah. um, you inscribed it, which I loved, but this was your last hard copy uh, that yeah. you gave me. So I've read this more than once. I love it. And I was just hoping that we could talk today about some of your stories again. Like I've heard these, but I wanted to do it for, you know, for perpetuity sure. here to record it and just hear about your time with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and your time at IBM taking license, taking IP from a cost center to a profit center and talk about how you build teams. So I just, I just want to pick your brain. That's really all it is. I have so much admiration for you and I want your message to get out there. Okay, well, fire away. Awesome. You know, you're known, Marshall, as the godfather of IP, and I think you've certainly earned that given what you did at IBM, given what you did at Microsoft, but then also lesser known things like starting intellectual ventures with Nathan Mirabold and other things. Right. So can you just give a little bit of your, your history from the way that you tell it? I know your book starts with you on a golf course. And you picked up the phone. So, yeah. so give us a little narrated tour. All right. Well, that was a call from Bill Gates. And for whatever reason, that day I had my phone with me at the Greenwich Country Club. And there's uh, no greater sin in a country club than answering a cell phone. And I did. Uh, for better or worse. And, I suppose I when Bill Gates is calling, you might, you might, you might buck the trend. But I didn't know that at the time. But I was off somewhere in the far reaches of the golf course, which is, thank God. And and it was Bill. And he said, um, uh, Marshall, I want you to come and talk to me about intellectual property. Uh, and I said, uh, are you kidding? And, and he said, no, I'm serious. So I, anyway, at the end of the day, I went home, talked to my wife. I said, I'm going to go out to Seattle talk to Bill Gates. And she said, you're out of your mind. You've retired from IBM. Why, why are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. His heart got it turned down. Sure. And so sure. so I did. And, uh, you know, we were sitting in his office with his feet up on his desk and my feet up on his desk. And we were playing Who Do You Know? And it's fun for for a different level. He was he knew everybody from the top down. I knew almost everybody from the bottom up, mm -hmm. and uh, it it worked out really really well. At the end of the day, he said, "I want you to come here and do for Microsoft what you did for IBM." Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is Microsoft didn't need any money. Sure. What they what they needed were friends, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll come back to this. IBM, of course, was out of out of box completely. In 1992, we laid off 200,000 employees at IBM, Gosh. which doesn't sound like much today, but that was a big damn deal at that. Sounds like we were, a lot. Yeah, we were, we were 100 days from bankruptcy. Hmm. Make a long story short, I I was in Japan for years and running the part of that operation. And I, it, it occurred to me that IBM's competitive advantage was that it, it owned software. That was never a thought in IBM's lexicon because they were hardware manufacturers. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, Microsoft or IBM made software that make these machines work. Mm -hmm. That was revolutionary thought, by the way, at the time. Yep. And I came back from IBM and I said, I want to run that stuff. And so they said, okay, you get to run it. And no one had a clue what the hell I was talking about. So I'm running this thing in 1992. We're laying off 200,000 employees a year. And things look fairly dire. And uh, it occurred to me, this is a hell of an asset. Why aren't we doing something with it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I decided to do something with it. Long story short, by the time I left IBM, we were making $2 billion a year. This is in the 90s. How much was IP caught as a cost center? How much was I, uh, IP costing IBM before you flipped it around? 
36 million. Okay, so it went from 36 million in the red to about 2 billion in the black. That's yeah. incredible. Can you tell the story that you told me about um, opening up the computer and putting like uh, yes, two can. picks on it? Yeah. The, the current CEO hired me was it was uh, graciously uh, allowed to retire. And they brought a fellow by the name of Lou Gerstner in. Mm -hmm. Now, Lou Gerstner, interesting man, was the youngest partner in McKinsey's history. Mm. Pretty smart guy. Uh, pretty smart guy. Except in these matters, okay. like, every, like everybody else. And so Lou comes in and finds out that I'm licensing our technology to everybody on the planet. This will be a broader discussion in a moment. And he sends me an email, X-rated, said, mm. what in the blank do you think you're blanking doing, licensing our blanking technology to our blanking competitors, basically? <laughs> I think it may have been the first email I ever sent. This was 1992. Okay. And we're struggling with how the hell do we explain this to him? Now, this is different than the chemical business and different from the medical business. This is the technology business. When there mm -hmm. are thousands and thousands of, you know, inventions in everything you do. Sure. Correct? So what we did was we took a laptop computer, which looks the same today as they did then. Mm. But today, obviously, they're much more powerful. We peeled off the top and we decided to uh, make little flags out of red cellophane and toothpicks and glue them into the computer. Remember, this is IBM's architecture. Sure. For everybody's technology that we were using. So that's what we did. We stopped at 150 because with our fat fingers, we couldn't get any more little flags in there and we took it and we dumped it on Lou's desk and this way here's why we have to license because we need the technology of others and every one of those red flags is a patented technology of one of our competitors and he looked at that and he said well i got it and we were for, we we're home free now the game was can we license our stuff to other companies for more of than their life again to us. And that's that $2 billion that you talked about earlier. And that was how we did that. So you yeah. wanted cross licenses from the, the companies that you were using their technology, but you wanted to be a net exporter of yes. technology so that you had a, you cleared the uh, profitability. Yeah, which is true for any company in the world today. Look at your company not a gigantic company at the moment, but you've got a good technology base. Mm -hmm. You can use that technology base to leverage your company's future in terms of technology you can get from others and technology you can charge for. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's why you do it. My, my opinion on this is that, and it still is, um, that it's easy to get trapped in the view that all... You have intellectual property, it's a negative right, and you can stop somebody from doing something. Mm. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck with that. That is not usually the case. Uh, and therefore, I think you should turn it into a business asset and figure out how to how to leverage that with other companies in your field. And maybe you'll even turn what you do into a standard and you'll make a fortune doing that. You've talked to me about the three different kind of the three parts of the triangle, the sword, the shield, which you hear a lot in IP, but I think the third part you don't hear as much about from other people is the olive branch. So sword, shield, olive branch of what you can do with intellectual property. And I think when you went to Microsoft, the olive branch became the really important part of the strategy there. Because when you joined, like you said earlier, it wasn't about making money. It was about they were making too much money and they were under investigation from the U.S. government for antitrust. And so how could you create peace with IP? Well, well, not only the U.S. government, with Europe and in Asia, 
they were the enemies of the world. They're kind of like where Meta is today and Google is today, because they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're there. But Microsoft, if you notice, and knock on wood, is avoiding all of that. And part of it is because nobody's mad at them. Yeah. And no, and and the reason is because now they have these cross relations. Think about a license agreement with another company as nothing other than a peace treaty. Okay. That that is what it is. Yep. Now, if you're not comfortable with peace treaties, then don't make them. But if you do make them, they last for a long time, and they're 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 very. You get to use their IP, and they get to use yours, and you can guys can be very happy about that in the future. So that was yep. why that happened. Can you talk? This is something that uh, I remember reading in the book, but uh, I could use some sorting out from you. Can you talk about open source? And uh, you talked about Red Hat in the book and about how important open source was and how, did, especially in the world of AI right now, I think this idea of open source models and how those will be used to proliferate technology, but also create proprietary advantages. How, how do you see this playing out either from you know, the Microsoft perspective or going forward with AI? It's a tough one in AI because I don't understand enough about AI yet. I do sure. know that Elon Musk is a big pusher of the, the kind of the open source model of AI. Yep. There will, right. there, yep. And I think Microsoft is too, but there will be others who want to make it pro their version of AI to be proprietary. Yep. And it all comes back to who thinks they have a competitive advantage in doing all that. Mm -hmm. And I... I wish I knew enough about the particular forms of AI that would say one is better than the other. I will say this. AI is scaring the hell out of enough people that I don't think governments of this world will allow any company to control any particular version of AI. Mm. And so I think what's going to happen here, this is again, again a bit of a standards argument, is that the AI that is created it's going to come down to who can create the best for the particular thing they're trying to do. And it won't be as a proprietary thing as much as it used to be in the past. I think okay. it'll be much, much more open and everybody will have to compete on the, uh, on that model, including you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, you know more about your business than I ever will, but, 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 my my view is you're going to have to compete in, in a more open world than I ever did. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of my my thought on that. And I would be prepared for that. Yep. If you, and AI is, is penetrating every business. You know, even going back into the 90s in electronics, we've yeah. been using EDA tools. And the EDA tools have evolved over time to becoming more advanced AI but for very long, they've been using regression algorithms and things that are common. So to design silicon. So actually, if you look at Jensen Wong's recent keynote uh, at the NVIDIA conference, he highlighted, I think the first third-party companies he talked about in his speech were Ansys, Cadence, and Synopsys. So these tools are uh, always important. That's that's an area that in electronics, it's, it's really impacting us. I'm I, kind of curious. I, I, I have never, I look, I... I'm kind of amazed a bit about the hand wringing about AI because it's been around for 30 years that I can think yeah. of. And, you know, it's nothing but smarter computers with more engines, you know, doing all this stuff and come up with answers faster, yeah. uh, which, which is fine. Now, in today's world, the media will have you faking each other and all this other kind of stuff that goes on. And that's probably true, but it's not like, AI is something really radically different. It's just better, yeah. and and now we'll 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 see what that does. I don't I don't know. But it's kind yeah. of fun. It is. It's very fun. The hardware platforms, the transformer models, the large language models, I think have been huge breakthroughs. But as you said, for people in the electronics industry, we've seen this for three decades. Well, uh, I have it on my I have it on my cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. I use it as a search engine, and it's very, very good. Sometimes it's too good. I get 
page after page after page after page. And I could settle for a couple of sentences. But anyway, that's that's uh, where we're you need the exact summary version. So yeah, you've done the you've done the really giant company stuff. I mean, you made IBM's biggest profit center, you helped Microsoft get through the antitrust window. But when you think about emerging technologies, so you talked a little bit about standards, but when you think about new marketplaces where it's more of a, a white space or a blue sky or right. however you want to call it, in this new open world and with the change of intellectual property rights with the America Invents Act and just the way that uh, companies view intellectual property, how do you think about building up a, um, a business value prop around intellectual property for these emerging categories of technology? Well... Okay, so this is a white sheet space. Um, mm -hmm. What I would what I would do, I would remember that the base of almost every great invention is intellectual property in the history of the world. Sure, whether it's Thomas Edison stuff, and you know, you can go back to Henry Ford's. It's all based on intellectual property. Your business is no different. I think I remember telling you this one day. Um, you, you know, you, you're, you're sitting there working on how do I funnel electricity into a an object from uh, an antenna. Mm -hmm. That you know, that's how you guys started out of Northwestern, if I recall. Yeah, that's right. And and it's true. So you invented some ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's in the, in a sense is all you had. Yep. And you can do two things with that. You can give it up to everybody else, or you can patent it, you know, protect it in some way, and see if you can make a business out of that. Now, maybe, and everybody thinks this way, they'll be the world's greatest hardware manufacturers doing this stuff. You know, we'll, sure. We'll, we'll turn ourselves into the Ford Motor Company of the I don't know, the, the electronic communications world or whatever. Yep. But the odds of that are not great. Yeah. But if you if you do that right and you've jumped the the gun on on, on your invention, you might be able to convince other people to use that intellectual property and help them too. And you make a piece of each one of those things. Yeah, that's what Microsoft and IBM decided to do, basically. And it really does help other companies get to market quicker with better results and less risk, which sure. at the end of the day, my experience is you have to overcome a certain amount of NIH or not invented here. But once you can get and usually that's more of an engineering symptom when you can get to the business owners that understand the opportunity of speed, like getting there faster getting there with better results and not having to reinvent the wheel, the business unit owners can usually push that forward at a different pace than the engineering team that says, wait, I thought I was hired to do this. Why would you want, why are you going to bring in some outsiders and outside technology? Well, that's exactly right. And, and, and what you've really said here is society moves forward faster that way. Absolutely. It really rises all boats. Right. And I think that's the point. And you make a boatload of money sitting there counting receipts. Hmm. And, and, and you can still, you still need to do the product development and all that other kind of stuff. But companies like Qualcomm, for example, that's all Qualcomm is. It's yep. kind of a, de a design shop. And, and let me put this broadly. What the United States really is, is a design shop for the world. Hmm. And this is a way to think about that. How yeah. how do you become a design shop? How do you stay a design shop? You do that by doing R and D that stays ahead of everybody else, and you do and you, and and you do the investment in the R and D, and you take that and you say, okay, what do I do with it? Well, some of it I'm going to use on my own. Some of it I'm going to license to other people. Now, there, there's a golden nugget in there. By all means, keep it. But most of these things are are, are kind of not gold. They're brass nuggets. And they'll and, move and, quickly. 
and they move quickly. And so that actually was heretical, by the way, when I thought about that back in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Nobody, nobody believed that. I mean, hmm. a patent was you know golden and you could protect yourself and you could sue other people. I'll go back to the point we were talking about about uh, this thing being a negative right, which I think is way overstated. Hmm. So when Lou Gerstner came to IBM, and he sent me that nasty email about why am I licensing with everybody? Mm -hmm. And we came up with that idea of showing him this stuff and we, we brought it to him and, and, and we got home free. That was a real sea change in, in American corporate thinking mm -hmm. at, at the time. Sure. And sure. so everybody, IBM, at &P, hung on these patents. They're going to sue the crap out of each other if you use them. And they did. And nobody got anywhere doing that. Yep. Particular. So that the was lawyers, the lawyers probably made a good amount of money, but no, no businesses did, moved forward. The lawyers did. Well, I am one of them, but the lawyers did just fine doing that. Sure. And that, sure. and that, and that was kind of the intellectual basis for all of that stuff. But my my personal view is, uh, if you look at this broadly, if, if you take all this stuff and you say, okay, I've got an asset here, I'm going to market it just like I'm going to market a car, or I'm going to market a antenna for an electronic transmission. That's what I'm going to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I can say to somebody, you pick a competitor, because I don't know them in your industry, and you say, look, I've done the R&D for you. Yep. You can pay me for doing that R&D and you're going to get it faster and cheaper and sooner than you otherwise would. And it's aligned and it's aligned with your success because we're going to take a per unit royalty. So if you go 10x we're, bigger than you thought you were, we're happy. If you go We're on the we're on the same page. Yep. yep. Well aligned. And then we're we're pals again. That was the uh, Microsoft Red Hat story. Uh, just to circle back for a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about intellectual ventures? Because it's quite the unique, you know, I can't tell if it's the friend or the enemy of Microsoft and it's kind of gone through evolution. So how did intellectual ventures start and what's it doing today? Well, it, 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 it started because there were a couple of guys who are sort of famous these days, Nathan Mirvold, yep. Edward Jung, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, who was more the biotech type, uh, Peter Detkin, who came from Intel, myself. Um, <laughs> and I, that's another one of these phone calls that come out of the blue. Uh, Nathan mm -hmm. called and said, come out and talk to me about becoming a partner in this thing. By the way, that's what got me to Microsoft's attention, by the way, that because Nathan obviously was the Chief scientist at Microsoft for a while. Got so, it. So I was yeah. before Microsoft for you. Yes. Okay. And and Nathan is a weird guy, and I mean weird in the nicest way. Okay. Uh, I, I I sat down with him for the first time in a warehouse in Bellevue, Washington, sitting on an Atlas missile. That is so odd. It, yes, as odd as it gets. Um, I hope. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I've never heard. I've never heard that one before. Sitting on a, a piece of uh, ammunition for your meeting. Yeah, that's what we did. And uh, uh, he's a, a very interesting guy. And you went into his office. He had all these movie props from movies with uh, dinosaurs and this, that, and the other. And they're all in the office, all over the place. And. Um, his idea, which I completely agreed with, was try to figure out how to monetize intellectual property. Gee, what a concept. So sure. he and I he and I had exactly the same thinking about that. Um, and so this was about I left IBM in 2000. So this was about 2001 and a half. Okay. And I joined Microsoft in 2003. That'll put the time frame there. 
So yeah. I'm out there in Seattle and we're working on that project. And he's got a boatload of intellectual property that he and Edward Jung and others had had decided to file and uh, and and get granted. But he had a view that he wasn't going to try to hold everybody up in the world, but he wanted you know to get a return for what his investment was. It was all that simple. Sure. And and that was it. And so I moved to the Seattle area. And, uh, you know, then I ended up, obviously, at Microsoft. Bill Gates came to after uh, Pierre Dick and myself. And he wanted one of us. Didn't matter which one it was. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, I ended up with it. Okay. And that was how I got there. Okay. What's IV up to these days from your perspective? I don't know. When I last was in the licensing world, IV was kind of petering out. Okay. Okay. I don't know that that's changed. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't. I haven't followed it. I know that they were selling their portfolio off pretty heavily. But the Maybe. idea. The idea that they had, which is right, is we need to really monetize intellectual property and get it out there into the firmament, get people to use it. Yep. And then you don't do that with saying, well, I'll just see you on the negative side if you do use it. Yeah. And, and, and so that part of the philosophy I got. You know, there is a there's a lot of learning that has to be done. Licensing is... You actually referred to it earlier. Most people, even that McKinsey guy, right? The That was the CEO. They're just not really intuitively smart about IP licensing. No, it kind of not sounds at like, all. That's for the lawyers. I'm not going to touch it. You know, that's kind no. of the, that's the behavior. I know. I got it. <laughs> They're done that. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Marshall. I'll let you know if anything comes from it in terms of follow-up. And I just look okay, forward nope. to staying in touch. Okay, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.